Welcome to Reflecting Light. This podcast is about feeling the world with light by exploring myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the works of artists, past and present, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And now, here is your host, Mandy Green. Hello, dear listeners. It's going to be a good summer. I realized this last season was a bit spit spotty as I was in graduate school and grossly underestimated the demands of being such a student. And so what I'd like to do while I have a little bit more breathing room, it's time to record. Now, I have tried to record this podcast two times already, and it just didn't feel right. It felt like something was missing. So hopefully third time's a charm. The question I am asked most often is, why Mary Magdalene? And I would love to answer that question in depth. I don't know that there is an audio source of information about her quite like I want to do today. So for all of you who want to know more about her or her wondering why is she important, what's going on with her story, this is the podcast to listen to. The second question I get most is, what keeps you a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Sorely tempted to answer that one for this season's final podcast episode, but I'm going to sit on that one and think. But I want you to know that Mary Magdalene is a key, key piece in my faith remaining strong and my desire to build the kingdom, to make our practices and our attitudes match up with our amazing theology. So the question is, who is Mary Magdalene and why does she matter? And I'll be looking at her in the canonical gospels as well as some extra biblical literature. Now, when you pull a thread, and we talk about this a lot on This podcast, if you pull a thread, if there's not much to it, that thread will pull out. But I found in regard to this amazing woman, when I pull a thread, it's tied to like 50 other threads, and I'm still pulling the thread, and it just keeps pulling more and more threads. She's that complex. She's that wonderful. And to me, she is the archetype of the saved woman. And as such, she has been an answer to decades of prayer, of if women matter in the kingdom of God, if we really have equal value to our brothers, and what is the exact role that we play in the kingdom of heaven. So my contention is that she is the most underrated critical figure in the history of the world. And now let me build my case. Popular sources identify her as a sinful woman and a prostitute. They also conflate her with all the other Marys and perpetuate this little story. I want to say it in the same voice as Punxsutawney Phil and Groundhog Day. This little tiny town in Western Galilee. Most of this character damage comes from Pope Gregory who delivering his 62nd homily in 591 CE stated, quote, She whom Luke calls the sinful woman, whom John calls Mary, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark. Pause right there. Do you see how he's taken three gospels and just mashed them into one account? Continuing on. And what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? It is clear, brothers, that the woman previously used the unguent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts. Well, scandalous. What's more scandalous is that none of that is actually true. Now, Gregory is a Western Roman Catholic pope. It's 591. West and East haven't split until 1054. But interestingly enough, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, they never get this idea of Mary. 
It's just because our own faith comes from a Western lens, and Catholic thought has dominated that at this time, that we get this incorrect personification of Mary. Now, more interesting is this text in Luke 7. It simply says in Greek that she is a sinner. Sinner could be any type of thing. It doesn't necessarily mean a sexual sin. Those who are Samaritans and Essenes, those who are outside the tradition of the time, are also considered sinners. And what's even more interesting is that in Jerome's translation in Latin, the word used is peccatrix, which would also be a woman with a lot of sins. And if you wanted to say a prostitute, it would be a meritrix. So even the Greek and Latin don't reflect any type of linguistic nuance that we are talking about a woman of the night. What's interesting also is that the woman in Luke 7 is not named at all. So to simply apply her to Mary Magdalene is a mistake. Now, why would he do that? Well, the church in Rome bases all of its power and authority on Peter as the head and the first and the greatest. And if you have this woman, this apostle, as she's often quoted as being in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, more about that later on in the podcast, then it creates this kind of power struggle between the two. And so to create supremacy, you've got to malign the woman who represents the competition. So by castigating Mary, by making her into a prostitute, they take whatever she has to say and dilute it with this false story. I imagine she knew it would happen. And the most important thing to her, as it always, always was, was that she serve the Lord that she is devoted to and that she loves. Her reputation is of little account because she knows the Lord sees her and knows her heart. More on that later in the podcast as well. Another thing Pope Gregory did in this account is he conflated all of the Marys into one. And that's going to bring up a lot of problems in many, many, many texts, including some of the texts. At the end of this podcast, I'll create a reading list that is available for any of you who want to read up on this and learn more. But even in many of those books, they are going to conflate her most prominently with Mary of Bethany. Now, to me, she is clearly not Mary of Bethany. She's Mary Magdalene. And so it's important that we re-separate those out. But again, if you can dilute her testimony, then that also helps you. One New Testament commentary comments, quote, Origen and other early textual interpreters viewed her as distinct from the mystical Mary of Bethany and from the penitent woman whose sins Jesus pardoned for anointing him in a like fashion. And recent scholarship by Elizabeth Schrader further reveals in the oldest text of John 11, which is called Papyrus 66, interestingly enough, the word, quote, the word Maria had been altered with the Greek iota symbol, the I scratched out and replaced with a theta that changed the name to Martha. And in a later verse, a woman's name was replaced with this sister's. Her belief was that with this action, the scribe diluted and distorted the presentation of Mary and robbed her of her confession in John eleven twenty seven 27, quote, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Elizabeth is further quoted as saying, it makes her one of many women interacting with Jesus as opposed to her being a prominent figure in the entire second half of the Gospel of John. Well, this is a very important point. Now, many of us know, for example, I have many friends by the name of Jen or Jennifer. And if I were to take all of them and simply 
tell you stories about all of these Jennifers. But then if you were taking down my account and decided to just put them all into one person, this is the problem that we have with the Marys. And so it is our job. Well, it's my job and Elizabeth Schrader's job and those of us who care. It's fascinating that no one has cared enough to sort this out those of us who care to start unraveling this mess. Now, this other myth that has to do with her is about Magdala. This is not even true. In the first century, there was not even a town by the name of Magdala. The first time that shows up in any text is in the sixth century AD. In the first century both Flavius Josephus and Pliny the Elder tell us about a town named Terrakia, which was a very Hellenized town. It had a hippodrome, many inhabitants in the same about location as Magdala. And why scholars continue to say that she's from this fishing town is beyond me. Now, if you go on a tour to Jerusalem and you go to Galilee, absolutely go to the church there, Magdala, it's built to the women who upheld the Savior's ministry and were essential to it. They have so many beautiful mosaics and pictures and sentiments. There's a piece of art in the basement that is so impactful, done in the golden mean of a woman touching the hem of Christ's robe. Geometrically and aesthetically, I'm not sure there's a painting in the world that would affect people more than that. But I digress. Magdala is not the name of a city. So where does she get this name? Well, according to the text, and this is my own new take on it. I can't find anybody who's written this. So this is a Mandy Green original is that beside her name, it's Mary Hay Magdalene in Greek. Hay is the definite article, the. So she's named Mary the Migdala, Mary the Magdalene. Now, Migdala is a Hebrew word. Aramaic is, and Hebrew are very similar. So the root here is Migdal, and it means the tower the tower of strength, the great one, the elevated one. A tower in this time was put right in the the center of the city and everyone would come to that center for protection, for help, for supplies. Now, if you break down the Hebrew word even more, the M at the beginning means with or from, and gadal means great, strength, might, and the ah is the feminine ending. So Migdala literally translates as a woman of greatness and strength or a woman of power or the exalted woman or the high woman. That's a very different story from the one Pope Gregory spun so many years ago. And yet the tragedy is that it's stuck for so many years, my friends, getting the information wrong about her and not bothering to correct it has created catastrophic misinformation and irreparable damage in many cases. A mere 1400 years later, on the feast day of St. Mary Magdalene, which is July 22nd, 1969, Pope John VI subtly rescinded this inaccurate characterization of Mary, revised the general Roman calendar with this comment, quote, no change has been made in the title of today's memorial, but it concerns only St. Mary Magdalene, to whom Christ appeared after his resurrection. It is not about the sister of St. Martha, nor about the sinful woman whose sins the Lord forgave. Now, what's even more interesting is that in 2016, Pope Francis elevated the Memorial of Mary Magdalene to a festival to stress her importance as a faithful disciple of Christ. And the Mass includes a specific preface entitled, quote, 
de apostolorum apostola, or the apostle of the apostles, close quote. We'll talk later about where she gets this amazing title. While many of us might not immediately grasp how important this monumental shift is, other than Sundays and solemnities, quote, it is the highest rank of importance raising her to be equal to that of the apostles, or perhaps even their superior. Let's look at where she actually shows up in scripture. The first time we meet her by name is in Luke chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered unto him of their substance. Right there in verse 2, we have Mary called the Magdalene, is how I would translate that. Notice that she is mentioned first of these certain women. Now, certain in Greek means someone who is either not identified for a specific purpose or is not identifiable. In my mind, these certain women certainly have something extraordinary about them. And to be called a certain woman is no small thing. Now, let's talk about this out of whom went seven demons or seven devils. I'm going to have to pull a few threads for us, but it's important that we begin to think of her in more enlightened, exalted terms. In the Greek-English lexicon of Liddell and Scott, the lexicon used for most academic publications, the definitions are derived from classical Greek novels. These are the definitions for demons, quote unquote. Number one, a god or a goddess a divine power. Number two, the power that controls one's fate or destiny. Number three, something higher than man or someone higher than man and lower than God. Demons doesn't even make the cut in Liddell and Scott's lexicon. To get demons, I had to go to the Thayer's Bible Dictionary to find the last and lowest definition as a demon or an evil spirit. Well, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to depend on the instruction I received from Dr. John F. Hall, who was a professor of ancient Greek and ancient studies at BYU, who explained all of this beautiful Greek nuance to me. The argument goes as follows. The rest of the the verse, out of whom went, I'm going to translate as she came out from seven daimones, seven godly places or seven celestial stations. Now in the Ascension of Isaiah, which is an apocryphal work, and let me pause here and talk about apocrypha. Apocrypha are books that were not canonized as part of the official testament, either because the authorship is questionable or because they're of a later date, or they seem to have quote unquote Gnostic leanings. Gnosticism is not even a categorized religion. There was no quote unquote Gnostic church. But gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge, this emphasis on knowledge as a path to salvation. In fact, it was Joseph Smith who said, a man comes to salvation no faster than he can obtain knowledge. Totally paraphrasing there, but. So an apocryphal work is one of those, or it's a text that was dug up or uncovered and they don't know its authorship. Now, as members of the church of Jesus Christ, apocrypha should be one of our go-tos. I think the Book of Mormon in most religious circles could be considered apocryphal literature. 
It was dug out of the ground. The source is not known and they cannot examine the plates. For members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Apocrypha should have a special meaning for us. Now, often I get a little pushback when people tell me to read Doctrine and Covenants section 91. Well, let's read it and let's understand what's written there. Section 91, verses 1 through 5. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha. There are many things contained therein that are true, and it is mostly translated correctly. There are many things contained therein that are not true, which are interpolations by the hands of men. Verily I say unto you that it is not needful that the Apocrypha should be translated. Therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand, for the Spirit manifesteth truth. And whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. There you have it. If you read it with the Spirit of truth, you can obtain great benefit. The only instruction there was it wasn't necessary that it be translated. Well, one such apocryphal book is The Ascension of Isaiah, translated by R.H. Charles. Again, I will put all of these readings in a reading list with quick links that you can easily look at. Now, on The Ascension of Isaiah, it is explained that Christ exists at the seventh level of the celestial heavens. There are seven celestial heavens, and the Elohim are in the eighth. Now, if you look at an ancient Egyptian text, it's believed that Satan is also attained at that seventh level. When you achieve that seventh level, and this is in Hugh Nibley's The Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri, you are called a son of the morning or a daughter of the dawn. Now, suddenly, that verse in Isaiah fourteen twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? Exclamation point. The shock that someone at this level could fall is almost unfathomable. The title Lucifer means light bearer. Here we have Christ at the seventh level of the celestial heavens. And the ascension of Isaiah speaks in depth about how Christ came down level by level in disguise. And at each level, he would take off glory and light so that he could pass through unnoticed, so that he could come into this world by stealth and not be picked up on by the enemy. It talks about this in great detail. The books of Enoch also talk about the seven celestial heavens. The ascension of Moses also talks about the seven celestial heavens. And again, I will link all of these in the show notes in that reading list. Now, to add to that, let me read to you from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith from page 304 and 305. Paul ascended into the third heavens, and he understood the three principal rounds of Jacob's ladder. Now, Joseph Smith continues where Paul saw and heard things which were not lawful for him to utter. Now here's the money point. Joseph continues, I could explain a hundredfold more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision were I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. And in another excerpt on page 301, Joseph Smith says, quote, Paul saw the third heavens and I more. In fact, he infers that he saw up through the seventh heaven. Now to back this up, I would also turn to the book of Revelation, where it seems that in John's theophany vision, he also is going to see these seven cities, which represent aspects of these seven celestial levels. So back to Mary Magdalene. 
instead of a woman whom seven demons came out of. And by the way, seven in Hebrew tradition, a number of completeness or wholeness. The earth wasn't complete until the seventh day on which God rested. There are seven days and Christ is resurrected on the eighth day or the new creation, the new world. So seven is a significant number. And John Hall, and I'm going to teach what he taught me, is going to state that Mary, who came down out of seven celestial levels. Well, this changes the game right here. We're talking about someone who is the Lord's equal in station, in ability, in light, and glory. And no wonder it was glossed over in the text. One could also say she's a woman who's been initiated into the mysteries. In Greek, the word mysterion can mean a ritual or something specifically for the initiated. In another extra biblical book, one that I came across in my study of Mary Magdalene, in all these years of trying to find this archetype of a woman of God, I came across this book called The Gospel of the Beloved Companion. And I'm currently working on an illustrated version of Mary's Ascent Vision at the end of that text. I have an amazing artist, amazing artist, and the first three sketches are already done, and I'm telling you, you're going to be blown away. We're going to begin pre-selling that book, I believe this fall, when it's closer to being completed. But in this, we're going to walk through the seven branches of the tree of life that Mary sees until she arrives at the eighth. I love her theophany vision here in the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. Now, the other thing about the Gospel, Beloved Companion, this is critical because here's another evidence for her title, Mary the Magdala, or Mary the Tower. And in this beautiful book, The Gospel of the Beloved Companion, the Savior gives her this title as she is anointing him prior to his death, crucifixion, and resurrection. Here you have a woman who anoints the Savior. Now, in a radical turn of events, in a ministry that is constantly asking of the Lord and begging of the Lord and taking from the Lord, here is a woman who, rather than taking and asking, gives. Now, anciently, kings could only be put on the throne by queens. And the title we most often refer to the Savior as Christ is the transliteration of Christos, which means the anointed. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah and means the anointed, Messiah. So one of his prominent titles comes from this anointing given by Mary at this supper. And she anoints the Savior and immediately is met with criticism and judgment and censure about the waste of the perfume. John's account tells us that the perfume filled the entire room and this beautiful act of devotion in which Mary is the one to give, and the Lord is the one to receive. She is not recognized as a queen or a priestess, but is censured for her waste, for the expense of the perfume. And I'd love to read you this account from the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. Six days before Passover, Yeshua came to Bethany. Then Miriam, the beloved companion, took a jar of pure and expensive spikenard and poured it upon the head of Yeshua and anointed him. Now pause here. 
This is why in art, you will always, always be able to identify Mary the Magdala because she's always holding this alabaster jar of ointment. Now, if I pull another fascinating thread about alabaster, it's that you can only get alabaster from the Luxor Valley in Egypt. Now, there's many tales that the beginning of the world began in Egypt with the Ben Ben stone in creation and the spirit hovering over the waters. And in addition to that, if you want to read another extra biblical text, which I highly, highly recommend, it's called The Life of Adam and Eve, another book that is just beautiful and heartbreaking and expansive in helping us grapple with and understand the absolute wretchedness of Adam and Eve and their fall. And there's a point in that book at the end of Adam's life when he's ailing so much, he sends Eve and one of his sons back to the garden to ask for some oil from the tree of life to anoint him. And the angel who guards the tree of life responds that the oil will not be given there, but will be given to the Savior in the meridian of time who will restore everything lost in the fall. So in a really fascinating question, where does this spy canard come from in the alabaster jar? No one knows, but that's a thread you can pull if you're interested. Continuing on with our text, and let me backtrack just a little. Then Miriam, the beloved companion, took a jar of pure and expensive spikenard and poured it upon the head of Yeshua and anointed him. In the Gospel of John, we're told that she anointed both his head and his feet. And the house was full of the sweet fragrance of the ointment. And seeing what she had done, The disciples therefore grumbled against her among themselves. But hearing this, Yeshua said to them, leave her be. And in the Greek, it's with an exclamation mark. She has anointed me for what I am come to do and done what she is appointed to do. Only from the truth I tell you, whenever they speak of me, What she has done will also be told in memory of her. You do not know or understand what she has done. I tell you this, when all have abandoned me, only she shall stand beside me like a tower, a tower built on a high hill and fortified cannot fall, nor can it be hidden. From this day forth, she shall be known as Migdala, for she shall be a tower to my flock, and the time will soon come when her tower shall stand alone beside mine. Well, that is a powerful witness of the Magdala. And it bothers me. If any of you are artists, please, please paint this moment. It bothers me so much that in these moments of crucifixion, in classical art or romantic art, you see these fainting, sobbing women. These women are not lightweights, my friends. These women are here for all of it. They're here for a gory graphic crucifixion, and they are not budging. They will not be moved. You tell me if they're fainting. Well, the Lord is crucified and buried, and then the Feast of Passover begins. So let's go to the account of resurrection in John 20. Now, right here in the first verse, we read over a detail that I think is really important and really descriptive of the character of Mary, the Magdala. And this is my translation. The first day of the week cometh Mary, the Magdalene, early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone. Now, we often read over this 
little detail while it was yet dark, but I want you to picture this woman walking through the streets of the old city in the middle of the night. It's the fourth watch of the night from 3 to 6 a.m. Here is the amygdala unflinching, unmoved. Being associated with the Savior at this time was not a favorable position to be in. In fact, Peter is picked out of a crowd and at that close scrutiny denies the Lord. In addition, everything's at heightened security. It's Passover. Pilate's already had this riot almost on his hands. And yet there she is. There she is. When the Pope in 1969 changed the narrative about Mary, instead of reading the text from Luke 7 about the sinful woman, which was the text read for over 1400 years during her feast day, he changed it to this text from the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, chapter 3. I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets, and in the broad ways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, Saw ye him whom my soul loveth. Now I'm going to pause right there. If I can get personal, when I visit Jerusalem, I always try to stay in the old city, meaning you're inside the old city wall. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the place where Christ is said to be crucified and buried. Archaeologically, all of the evidence points to that. Now, in the current city of Jerusalem, it's inside the city walls. But at the time of Christ, that area was actually outside the city walls and was a place where a crucifixion would have taken place. It doesn't take place inside the city. It takes place outside the city. And the Templars built their cathedral there at the center point of Christianity. And it's a really fascinating building. If it's really a receptacle for what's brought into it. If you visit it during the day, which is the first few times I visited the church, you're going to think, what is holy about this? It's this wild cacophony of people and tourists. And yet there's just these beautiful moments of devotion and love that you see exemplified. But you see a lot of contention and irritability as well. Well, when I stay in Jerusalem, and because of jet lag, I always wake early, and I dress quietly, and I creep down to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, the streets of Jerusalem are so quiet in the morning. You walk through these stone-lined streets, through this labyrinth to this beautiful church. There's a Muslim family who holds the key to the sepulcher, and it's been passed down for generations from father to son. And at 5.30 a.m., they bring out the big iron key and unlock these heavy wooden doors with ironwork on them and open this church. Well, when I go in the morning, I love to stop at the anointing stone I love to wander the hallways, but I always end up in the Chapel of Mary Magdalene, which is on the left side of the structure. Now, in Templar buildings, normally for the initiates, the right side is masculine and the left side is feminine. And there on the left side is the Chapel of Mary Magdalene. And I love to go in there as the priest is lighting the incense as you're starting to hear noise fill the cathedral, the church, and read the Song of Songs and John 20. And I read the passage that I just quoted to you about her searching for her beloved in the streets of Jerusalem. And I close my eyes and I can't help but picture her running through these streets trying to make her way to the Lord. A contemporary of this time 
Rabbi Ben Akiva, quoted as saying in the Mishnah Yadayim, For the whole world is not worthy as the day on which the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all scriptures are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Nevertheless, she comes to the grave, it's empty. She races to find the other disciples. They come and look at the scene, and here is what's so interesting. They turn around and go home. But Mary stays. And we're told that it is in this garden that the Lord finds her and asks her why she is weeping. To which Mary replies, Tell me where you have taken him, and I will bear him away. Now in this moment, I picture Arwen from Lord of the Rings when she's racing against the nine black riders and crosses the river to Rivendell, and the black riders confront her and ask her to give up the halfling. And she raises up on her horse with her sword and says, if you want him, come and claim him. This is the type of immortal, beautiful, but mortal woman we see here in this resurrection account. And it is simply the Lord's mention of her name that sparks recognition in her. And she rushes to him and clings to him. And it is from this moment that she gets this title of apostle to the apostles. The text says, And Jesus said to her, Miriam, and she turned herself around. Now in Hebrew, the word repent is tshuv. It means to turn around. And there's this beautiful moment where instead of looking at the empty tomb and the death and the emptiness and everything that she had lost, as she turns herself around, the Savior is right there. In this, I think she gives us a beautiful lesson of how easy it is for us in the mortal world to focus on the empty tomb, to look at everything we've lost instead of turning ourselves around to see that the Lord is right there with us. Continuing with the text, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which can be translated master, prince, chief, or husband. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me. The Joseph Smith translation is cling to me. Could also mean be attached to me. For I have not yet ascended. And here's the key piece. Again, going back to this idea of ascension or climbing the mountain or the mountain of the Lord's house, these seven celestial levels or the temple. And here's where she gets this beautiful title of apostle to the apostles. The Lord tells her, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God, and to your God. So Mary Magdalene went and reported to the disciples, I have seen, I have witnessed, and I have been in the presence of God, is how I translate it in the Greek. I think the King James says, I've seen the Master. To be sent comes from the Greek word apostoleo, which means to be sent forth, to be given a commission. And this is where she gets this beautiful title of Apostle to the Apostles. The Lord literally sends her forth to be the preeminent witness of his resurrection to those he has called and already sent forth. So in Greek terms, that is why she's called the Apostle to the Apostles. It's fascinating to me that the Lord, the ultimate champion of women, chooses a woman to be the preeminent witness of his resurrection. He knows the time they live in. He knows that women aren't even allowed to testify in a court of law. And yet here he is 
turning the world upside down by choosing his most devoted disciple to be the one to bear the first witness of his resurrection. Some people say it's even this beautiful bookend to the witness of the Samaritan woman at the well and Mary at this time as the witness of his resurrection. Well, unlike the woman at the well, Mary's witness is not received. In fact, the text goes either silent or we hear of people questioning her or doubting her testimony. And this is what's really tough about her story. The Savior chose her. Who are we to minimize that? That's something we should all be thinking about. To Mary, the beautiful thing about her is that she always put the Lord first. She was here to bring glory and honor to perform her mortal assignments. Here we have Jesus and Mary showing us a better way. In all of the work he is to accomplish, she is essential in preparing him and anointing him for that work. In these really dark moments, she is there like a tower, giving, sustaining. And I think the Savior knew that her name would be Turn to mud. In fact, in all four gospels, he said to center the apostles and say, What she has done will be told of her. Now, it's rare to find something in all four gospels, but that is something that is found. And yet, what has been told of her? This false, terrible story. It's time that we learn more about her and write this story. In the last Star Wars film, In the Rise of Skywalker, you notice that it takes both Kylo Ren and Rey fighting together to defeat the evil Emperor Palpatine. They both sacrifice different things so that evil can be defeated. These are strong archetypes, aren't they? And they show up in this beautiful story. All these archetypes run very, very deep. Perhaps they're using veiled symbolism to teach us something about who this woman really is. I hope you will want to take a greater look at her. This whole tradition is hidden for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. In fact, it's hidden in plain sight. It's right in front of you. If this lights a fire in you, if there's something in what I'm saying that speaks to you, give it some space, give it some love and see what happens. If I can quote from the gospel of the beloved companion, I will read when she reaches the eighth level or this top point, quote, as if from a great distance, I heard the voice of my master tell me, Miriam, whom I have called the Migdala. Now you have seen the all and have known the truth of yourself. The truth is that I am. Now you have become the completion of completions. In fact, in the Gospel of Philip, she said to be the woman who knew the all. If you are like me and you have had this wound wondering what your place is, and if the Lord sees you, and if the Lord values you, may I hold up Mary as the example? She gave everything to make sure the Lord succeeded in his mission. She wasn't as concerned about her reputation and her life as she was about helping him fulfill his mission. And yet, because of this beautiful reciprocity that exists between them, I can see the Savior pointing to her. I've heard him whisper to me, look to her, look to her. She will show you the way. Knowing what would happen to her mortal reputation, he still points to her as the way for us to understand how this beautiful dyadic dance plays out on a grand cosmic 
heavenly scale. And that is the beauty of the relationship between Jesus Christ and Mary the Magdala. Well, my friends, I feel that's enough for today. History's messy, scripture's messy, and that's all okay. But as we contemplate the Magdala, it's said in Margaret Starbird's book, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar, she contends that the return of the bride is what will bring back this beautiful balance that existed at the beginning of time. That when we only live by the light of a masculine sun, everything burns. You get a desert 24-7. It's parched. There's no water. There's no cool. And so this prophecy about Micah and water flowing and the desert blooming is the return of the bride, this peace that has been missing for so long from our liturgy, from our practices. And this is the work that's upon us. It's about bringing back this beautiful balance of male and female in everything I say. I hope you know that the one thing I've learned in studying our Heavenly Mother and in studying Mary the Magdala is that any disparagement of the divine masculine is intolerable. Those are fighting words. And so my dear brothers, as I speak, please know that I am enlisting you in this great cause. The eternal verity is that we will rise or fall together. And after centuries of falling, isn't it time we rose Isn't it time that we went arm in arm together toward this beautiful Zion? I'll end here with a quote from the author Adam Miller, who spoke at Brigham Young University a few years ago and said this, In addition to arguing that the differences between men and women are real and important, and spiritually significant. The proclamation also boldly proclaims that men and women are intended by divine design to be equal partners. It seems increasingly obvious to me that in our day, defending the family means defending women from both the subtle and violent forms of degradation, abuse, and marginalization that riddle our world. It means taking seriously, perhaps for the first time in the history of the world, the solemn declaration that God intends for men and women to be equal partners. In my view, this will be the defining moral issue of our generation. I love this sentiment, and I add my witness that it's going to take all of us, to come to this place of beauty, to come to this place of partnership, to link arms, to play to our unique gifts that are part of all genders and link arms together and invite the return of the bridegroom. And in that great endeavor, I feel that nothing will help us more than knowing Mary the Magdala, Mary the Exalted, Mary the Tower. That is the podcast for today. I know it's a long one, but feel free to share it. Feel free to write in with questions. My email is mandybrookgreen at gmail.com. That's M-A-N-D-Y-B-R-O-O-K-E-G-R-E-E-N at gmail.com. Let's begin the discussion. Let's begin to shift this tide of opinion about her. Additionally, on the show notes of this that can be found at mandybgreen.com, my website, on the podcast, I'll include a recommended reading list for more information about some of the things we've discussed And if you'd like to come with me to England next fall, it will be September of 2025. 
we will explore some of these sites that are purported to be part of this great tradition of Christ and Mary Magdalene and so many beautiful and exciting things. So thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging. I wish you love and light in your journey. Thank you for joining us for Reflecting Light with Mandy Green. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a good rating and share it with your friends. And remember, your light makes the world a brighter place. Share it.